Very warm welcome to everybody. Hello. I'm trusting that you are warm this afternoon, this Wednesday afternoon. So good to have you all with us this afternoon. People are busy logging in. Thank you for joining today's practical workshop um, on how we can engage, inspire, and involve fathers in the first thousand days. And it's so good to have you with us. Um, my name is Ruth, Ruth Lundy. And with me today, we have Richard and Daisy, Richard Lundy and Daisy Pierce from the team, and we will be hosting you today. Uh, and so it's so good to see you all this afternoon. To get started today, I see people are joining in. I'm trusting everybody's connected to sound. I would like to open in prayer. So let's open in prayer. Dear Lord God, I thank you for this opportunity for us to come together this Wednesday at and to discuss this important topic of how we can encourage and engage our fathers within the first thousand days. I pray that you would be with us this afternoon, that you would be um, helping us to think of creative ways to engage um, and involve fathers in the first thousand days. And I pray that you would be speaking to each of us and seeing how we can play our part um, as members of churches and seeing what our churches can do in this important topic. So thank you for this opportunity and we pray that you would be with us in Jesus' name. We know that every person has a fatherhood story and our um, fatherhood stories all look different and are unique and sometimes they can be fairly complex and we, they come with, as we think about fathers and fatherhood, they come with a range of memories, a range of hopes and disappointments in as we think about this topic and so I'm trusting that as we go through today's topic, um, that this would really be a time for you to also reflect on your own fatherhood story um, and what this means for you as a leader in your church and engaging with fathers. Um, we keep using this phrase FTD friendly church and today's workshop, we are looking at how we can help us journey as first thousand day friendly churches. So what is a first thousand day friendly? Why do we believe that all churches across South Africa can be FTD friendly? Um, by what I mean is that um, first thousand days we're looking at, uh, I'd love somebody to maybe unmute or put that in the chat box. What do we mean by FTD or first thousand days? It should be an easy question for most in the room. Who would be first off the mark to tell me what first thousand days is? I will, Ruth. Can you hear me? I can Hi. hear you, Sophie. Welcome. So the first thousand days is between, uh, I mean, when it's con it's between conception until the baby or the child is two years old. First thousand days friendly is just where. Um, the body of Christ embrace mom and dad during that time, make them feel welcome and feel that they belong there. Not if baby maybe cry or then everybody's looking funny at the mom or also that there's a place where mom can breastfeed. But just for me, most of all is for the mom to have that loving, welcoming, the parents in that space, welcoming, um, how can I say, a church to feel welcome and loved. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Sophie. You've done a great summary there. We completely, it's the first two years of life, pregnancy to two, a thousand days, and we're looking at that family, the parents around that child, how we can help them feel welcome within the church space. Um, and I love the way what you've described there with mom. And today we're wanting to put a little bit of emphasis on saying, let's not forget about dad. And how can we also help dad to feel welcome? So when we think about a first thousand day friendly church, um, as Sukunya, we've kind of divided it up into six areas um, that churches can be looking at. And um, Sophie, you spoke about this welcoming space that's surrounding our families, that's coming around our parents. So as first thousand day friendly churches, we're looking at how we can speak up, how we can surround our families, how we can collaborate and refer, how we can equip and prepare, how we can be praying and how we can be creating these warm and welcoming spaces. So today, as we're going through this topic of how we can engage and inspire and involve fathers in the first thousand days, while they're expecting fathers or new dads, 
dads with a toddler and a baby, we're thinking about these six areas and how as churches we can play a part in this. So to kick off this conversation, we are going to watch a little video that's been sent in by one of the pastors in the network um, and a, a video of him engaging with his child to start off the conversation. So Richard's going to share the video with us now. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Richard. I'll be hosting a panel discussion on fatherhood. And what we love about this particular video that was sent in is it's short, it's sweet, and it demonstrates how easy it is to play with young children. Uh, you don't need a degree. You don't need to go to university uh, to play with young children. And that was part of our everyday play campaign that we ran at the beginning of this year. But uh, we also like this video because it shows something of how uh, sometimes it's unexpected when we see a man on his hands and knees uh, playing with a child in that way. Uh, sometimes we expect the man to be on the couch, the one watching the play take place, and the man is waiting, or the father is waiting uh, for an opportunity, or perhaps just watching. Um, and we also love this video because it shows a pastor role modeling to his church or to anybody who sends this video to role modeling something of saying, when we're thinking about engaging fathers out there, we're also thinking about fathers inside our own household, which for many pastors is them themselves. And so this video wonderfully highlights the opportunity we have to uh, play with our, our young children, but it also holds up a mirror to ourselves and saying, how are we doing when we are playing with our young children, being actively involved and engaged in the lives of our young children? So that was just a short video. And I, and I encourage you, when you're thinking about uh, men playing with young children in that particular way on your hands and knees, uh, to encourage men to be doing that. And you might already have recognized there are some barriers, some things that get in the way of doing that. And that's why today we have invited several guest speakers that I will be interviewing and asking questions over the next little while to get their expertise into the room that can inspire us and inform us how we can reach out to men and fathers in our community to strengthen their, their engagement with their young children. And so uh, as, each, as I introduce each person, they're going to tell us a little bit about themselves and I have a range of questions that I hope to get through over the next little while. So the first question I have for Nkosi Martin Sikabai, he is from Heartlines. Uh, I'm gonna first ask him to introduce himself. He's no stranger to Sikunia, but you might not yet have heard about Heartlines. So Nkosi Nati, can you uh, introduce yourself to everybody and tell us what Heartlines is and what Fathers Matters is uh, before I ask you a question about fatherhood. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for being part of this um, amazing workshop. My name is Nkosanati Sikabai. Uh, I'm based in Cape Town, uh, pastoring a church, and I also work for Hotlines, um, leading the Fathers Matter uh, uh, church leg of what we're doing as Hotlines. Hotlines is a center for values we have different campaigns and some of you might know the eight films and eight values uh, and a national conversation and then a lot of other movies that we've done we are very much into the edutainment space and so we've taken up this campaign of father's matter as one of the critical issues right now in our country and so that's that's in a nutshell my my introduction a father um, a married man and a father to four kids that is important. <laughs> that is, and that keeps you busy, hey? One of the biggest responsibilities you have. Two girls and two boys. That keeps me busy. Wonderful. Okay. Now, part of Heartline's methodology is to do some excellent research before engaging in any kind of activities. And so you, uh, Heartline's ran research into fatherhood in the South African context. Can you mm -hmm. paint a for us, oftentimes when we think of fatherhood, we, we think of our own fatherhood story, uh, the father that's uh, with our own father or us being fathers to others. But what are some of the trends that you see about the state of fatherhood in South Africa? 
Uh, I think the, the big the big issues we did a research um, because before any campaign we engage in a research, and so we did this research and we pick up a few things and we pick up about eight things that were very clear is that first of all key themes a father's responsibility is more than providing money and um, which is one of the things that was big a lot of people thought that fathers are basically there to provide money if they are not if if they can't provide then they can't be fathers and one of them we picked up is that women can and 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 extended families not only women but extended families can be barriers in in fathers accessing their children and for a number of reasons cultural reasons but also for the fact that probably they the whole issue of money being a factor so a lot of fathers want to be involved but they they can't and we also picked that 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 um a lot of fathers are battling with skills. I like this video because it shows the basic skill of just playing with a child. It's not a, it's not a scientific, there's no scientific method basically, but a lot of fathers feel inadequate and, and not able to, to you know, the, the, just the basic skills on how to connect with children. And we also discovered that social fathers, you know, are very critical in the life of a child um, and they play a significant role. Hence, our, <clears throat> hence our, our campaign is promoting the active, positive presence of men, because we realize that in some cases, the father, the biological father might not be there, but there's a lot of uncles, there's a lot of coaches, there's a lot of other grandfathers that play that role in the life of a child. And so that's one of the things that we picked up. Obviously, one of the things that we picked up is what you guys are, are, are Isukunye is promoting, which is the first thousand days are so critical in the life of a child we we that cannot be disputed in any way science has proven it and um and the last one is that the, the well-being of a child um is can be developed if both the mother and the father are involved in the life of a child um yeah so those are some of the issues that we picked up but um the cultural barriers are one of the biggest ones for for us because I, I, you, you mentioned this term about a social father and how uh, yeah. for other people in this webinar or watching later, you're thinking of families in your church or you're thinking of, a, of a, what you might call a single mom. But there are mm -hmm. oftentimes these other adult male uh, role models or figures in the life of that child. And so when we're talking mm -hmm. about fathers, you might say, oh, that father's gone. And you're thinking about the biological father. And what I love about yeah. what Hartmans is saying, you can draw in social fathers to be more positively and actively involved in the lives it doesn't have to be their biological child, but it's a child yeah. in, their, in their care or within their range of care, maybe in the household, maybe as an extended relative. But I unpack for us in Kutsinati, why is fatherhood or father positive father engagement, why, why is that so important? It is very crucial because in the absence of a positive uh, father presence, there are a few things that might happen. The child, actually the statistics show that over 60 percent i think probably all of us have read that over 60 percent of children in our country are living without a biological father and that that is a that is a really challenge a big challenge so we mean that the gap is just so huge and in the absence of that father uh, you know then children become victims or perpetrators of violence of gender-based violence, which is one of the things that we, we, we see in our country. Uh, also, drug and alcohol abuse has been linked to the absence of fathers. And so the, the chances of your child, if you're not active in the life of your child, the chances of your child being involved in drugs and alcohol is very high, or being a victim or a perpetrator of gender-based violence is very high. The other one, and especially amongst young people, we're seeing the issue of mental health. Mental health has become a big fact. Uh, we, we've, we've seen a lot of young people committing suicide. And this is one of the biggest issues. And that speaks to the mental health of the child and so and mental disorders. So we're seeing that happening as a result of that. Teenage pregnancy obviously is one of the things that, that we see. Then, then educational and economic outcomes tend to be negative because a lot of the kids there's no motivation, there's no authority figure in the home, and majority of them drop out of school. 
and they don't see any motivation. And so we see that happening a lot um, in the schools. And so those are some of just the key things that we've seen based on the research that these can impact the child very negatively. Yeah. And Kusinati, I so appreciate you raising those issues because when we look across our society, the communities where we are, and we, we long for a brighter future for South Africa. And what you've helped us see is that one element, it's not the only element, but one right. element of seeing a, a new story for the future of the communities we're living in and the country we live in is to see more positively and actively and present fathers uh, in the lives of their young children. I so appreciate it. We're gonna, we're gonna come back to you in a little while to ask you more about Father Matters, uh, but now we're gonna focus a little bit on the Parent Center. Uh, so Jonathan Hoffenberg, he, he is a new position within the, the Parent Center. So Jonathan, could you uh, introduce yourself please and tell us a little bit more about the Parent Center before we ask you about fatherhood specifically? Fantastic. Thank you very much, Richard, and thank you to everybody, and, and welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Jonathan Hoffenberg. Um, I'm a, a male social worker. Yes, they do actually exist. There are very few of us. Um, I've been a, a social worker now for 16 years, having come to university, back to university at the age of 30, having worked in um, the hospitality trade and then in community development. Um, and I now work, I've been in private practice for many years where I did a lot of work, especially around blended families, um, and a lot of, of, you know, non-normative children. So children with learning disabilities and autism and, and that type of stuff. And I now work for the parent center, which is, uh, an old, um, South African, I mean, Cape Town-based NGO. It was started in 1983 as a project of child welfare, became a independent NGO in 1997. And it really aims to have an impact on children's lives through positive parenting. So currently the, the Parent Center runs, has a positive training um, section, which is one of the things that I manage, which train um, communities and parents in positive parenting. We have counseling, we have parents who are um, referred to by the family advocate for um, co-parenting. We have a fatherhood program um, whose hat I'm currently wearing. Um, and then we have two other sections. One is working in three um, black communities in Cape Town around teen pregnancies. And then we have uh, integrated into the clinics, a system for young parents, um, parent infants, especially around postpartum depression, which is can be kind of um, quite uh, common, but it's it's really that parenting in those first two years. And I love the 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 person who came on to talk about the the first two years as a critical time for the nurturing of the relationship between, the parents and the child, but we also know that biologically there is a, a phenomenal amount of um, cognitive development. So the brain itself is very, very hard at work. The body is developing, um, you know, extremely fast. And we know all over the world that if we put a lot of interventions into the first thousand years around nutrition, around good parenting, it carries across all the way into the child's development. So it's a crucial time for um, parents, it's a crucial time for um, children, but it's also two years that lay down the, the blueprint for the rest of the child's life. Yeah. Uh, that's that's you echoing so much of what we're saying at Sukuni and saying when you start young and you build those foundations, you set a child up in terms of brain development exceptionally well. And like in course, United said, you, when you start young, that bond between father and child can be formed strong and and last many 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 years. But uh, mm -hmm. Jonathan, you 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 in explaining what the the parent center does, you mentioned the various different uh, programs or interventions or initiatives. Of course, Nazi has painted a picture of us of what the state of fatherhood is and why it's so important. But these interventions or programs, why do we need them? Well, I mean, I think, and, and let's, let's return back to some of the basics. When, when you say that a child was mothered, we talk about a whole range of interventions. We talk about nurturing. But in English, the term father 
I fathered a child is, is almost akin to you know, the biological de deposit into a woman's womb of a child, and that's it. And we have so many different um, cultures and languages in this country, but I think in all of them, we're currently experiencing a crisis in masculinity. And we're experiencing a crisis in masculinity that is uh, that at the forefront is horrendous living conditions for women and children and a very high rate of, of gender violence. And I, and I think for me as a social worker and at the parent center, one of the primary things that, that you know, in, in, in talking to men and talking to, to fathers, it's recognizing that as men, we play a role in the protective atmosphere in which women and, and, and children flourish. But in speaking to this particular, I think gender roles are interesting in that we can talk about, um, I mean, there's the, the words like the patriarchy and toxic masculinity and all these various buzzwords. And we can talk about that, that it's kind of commonly understood that the, the larger um, world that South Africans live in is a very male dominated one. But those first thousand, um, first thousand days and um, when children are in their first two years and are baby is often very much a woman's place and a place where a lot of fathers find it difficult to engage and to navigate through. But it's critical that fathers are engaging in their full spectrum of, of fathering. And I think one of the things that Anati said that was really important is fathers Fathers are there to set boundaries. Fathers traditionally are there to provide for their families. I'm, a, I'm, I'm Jewish myself, so this is an ironic statement, but fathers are traditionally there to bring home the bacon, not that I do. Um, and, and we have, sadly, a lot of ideas that say that fathering purely stops there. And there's tons of research, and Anati was, was speaking to it as well, that there are strong benefits to fathers being involved in their children. There's strong benefits to fathers for women um, when they're involved, you know, play, taking an active role in um, caregiving. There's a great benefit to fathers themselves. You know, there's a lot of research that shows, especially, and, and COVID, I often say that COVID is, is the gift that keeps on giving. COVID has had massive repercussions in so many ways. One of the, I think, the unintended potential benefits that COVID has had is I think that we have, as men have been very good in creating these two separate worlds of the world of work and the world at home. And what COVID very much did is it smushed the two together. And for a lot of fathers, I think it was, so for some of them, the first time that they were really involved in the in the day to day care of their children, in doing homework, in cooking, cleaning, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I hope as we return back to normalcy, supposedly, that that we don't lose this. That fathers can be involved from the the day one, and that it helps fathers themselves. It it grounds you. It makes you much less to much less likely to be involved in in risky behaviour. It can have improvements on your steady employment. You know, we have a, a sadly a, a quite a narcissistic world that only talks about the individual. And I think faith plays a big role in making us aware of our connection to God and to the um, broader environment. And I think the parenting does as well. And I think also fatherhood is an opportunity to actively challenge a lot of the misperceptions around men that we, that we have. Um, and so even though the first two years can often be a time where men are hesitant because, oh, the, you know, the mother needs to breastfeed and often mothers know best. And I, I, I echo what Anati is saying that I think especially as we're seeing the, the breakdown of the nuclear family and um, um, an increasing divorce rate, that increasingly we're seeing in some cases where women actively discourage men from being involved in parenting. 
there's been some really important court cases, gone are the days when if men didn't pay maintenance and men, if, if you're, you know, divorced, um, if you're, un, you know, in an unmarried relationship where you're not living with your children, you need to be paying maintenance, but a woman can't claim or use the fact that a, that a father has not paid maintenance as an excuse to not have access to a child. The, the new children's le legislation is very clear. A child needs to have a significant relationship with both parents. Mm -hmm. And when it's the, that early stage where a child is young, it is, as the video shows, it's about playing, it's about showing your love, it's about engaging in your vulnerability as a man and being able to, to express your emotion that largely starts to set a relationship that pays so many benefits as the child grows up. Yeah, and Jonathan, I appreciate what you've shared. And there's so many different things I want to talk to. I wish this webinar was several hours longer. Um, and Kwasi Naisi mentioned some of the things that get in the way of men being more actively involved and some of that being uh, traditional understanding of what a man should or could do or must do and what he should or could or mustn't do. Uh, and sometimes there's other uh, gatekeepers and saying, no, you can't, you can't be a father until you do this and this and that. And sometimes mm -hmm. there's these, these, uh, I, I'm going to put them in the, the thing of myths. Like, I don't know. No one ever tells us these things. It's just what we kind of breathe in the air around here. My, my wife was out, uh, Ruth was uh, uh, out of the, out of town. I was taking care of our three children and I was handling everything. And then one day I get to, to school and my eight-year-old has wonderful, long curly hair, which requires a fair amount of brushing to get it right. And uh, I, I put the, uh, the scrunchie in the hair and we get to school and it come out already. I'm like, okay. And so there I'm standing at the entrance to the school and I'm brushing her hair. And I felt this, a, a strange range of emotions of going, I, I feel weird doing this. I, I couldn't find words to describe it. And I was like, why do I feel odd doing this when mm. I'm brushing my own daughter's hair? So I'm, uh, you know, it's a simple task that any parent can do, but yeah. somewhere, somewhere along the line, I had taken it on that moms do that and dads do this. And so part of what churches can do to be participating in is breaking down some of those stereotypes, creating a space for men to talk these things through. Because, you know, even as I said out loud, I feel silly, right? I'm like, where did that come from? Of course, I don't believe that's a masculine task or a feminine task. But some way I've picked that up. And programs that aim at fathers can help bring men together to share, like, I also feel that, hey, Let's leave that behind. That's not useful in the, what we want to be, the kind of men we want to be or the kind of fathers or the kind of social fathers we want to be. Let's leave that behind and pick up a more beautiful form of what it means to be an active and engaged father. And so mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'd love to hear from Bishop Selepi. He is a, a champion who is on the ground working with churches. Jonathan, I'm going to come back to you with another question in a few moments. But Bishop Selepi, as a church leader, uh, you're actively drawing other church leaders in to be putting into practice different fatherhood initiatives and programs. Can, can you unpack for us, what is your, uh, and, and share for us, what is your motivation as a, as a church leader? Uh, we've heard the, a, a range of research that both Jonathan and Corsina you have shown, but kind of as a church leader, why are you involved with uh, getting fathers more involved? I appreciate the invitation to be part of this meeting today. And just to share my personal experience, I know uh, where I had thought I would start is not where you, you want me to start, but no problem. I will, I will start just there. Uh, basically, what happens is that I I'm involved with Association for Pastors. Uh, I have an organ, a fraternal that I'm running, and we also have a relationship with other fraternals nearby and organizations. We are facing several challenges, but the approach that we have decided to use, one, it's one-on-one. -on -one. Speak to a friend. I noticed that speaking to friends does not need a lot of resources, energy, because after all, every day you meet your friend and you speak on different issues. You are able to ask questions and say, what about this? 
ever since I came to be part of Heartlines, I noticed on the program that says, what's your story? It opened us, the barriers that were existing and we were not aware. That helped us to share individual stories. In a process of sharing the stories, you see those gaps, whether a person had a parent or both parents or the father was there or not there. In our culture, your name is important and your surname is not important. Your surname is critical because your surname identifies who you are while your name is just a brand that you say, I want to be known this way. So one-on-one -on -one has helped. Secondly, because we have access to some media houses. Tonight I'll be speaking on Tawela FM from 29 hours. Whenever we have an opportunity to speak there, we use the platform to create further conversation about fatherhood. Whether it's a national radio station or it's a local radio station, we do that. Thirdly, we have local NGOs, like one of them is called Mangkwen Community Advice Center. We have some advice centers around that is able to meet with the communities. And when we go to their meetings or we invite them or they invite us, we're able to continue with the conversation. There are issues that are cultural, others that are religious, others that are, uh, um, can be addressed by other structures. Hence, we also work with traditional leaders and traditional leaders councils. So unless you build a relationship with those other structures, all those people, they become your resource. One was asking a question, though you did not ask me, unless you're going to ask me later, uh, what's happening on Father's Day? On Father's Day, we have different societal gatherings. I don't know if you have a language uh, in, your, in your context, what we call the Piri. Mm -hmm. The Piri is those men in our community per ward or per block that assist when there's a death case in the home and even to prepare the gravesite until we are done. They've got their own sessions. We're able to say, hey, come, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. Because there, there are no formalities there. We just talk at random. And men are able to open up their hearts and put their issues on the table. Because there's no other, in particular, women are not there to listen to the stories. So they can speak anything. And there are languages that the, the, the Language that is spoken there is only good there. You can't bring it here because <laughs> it may cause a lot and lot of uh, problems. So just two days ago, we had a visit to the executive of another fraternal talking about the same issues. So one-on-one -on -one and when we visit and work together and we use available platforms, whether there's a funeral you are officiating or you are given an opportunity to speak from any angle, you are able to introduce this. So we are using several approaches and it seems to be gaining momentum. Wonderful. Uh, Bishop Salepi, I, I just love those different examples that you've given, and I'm going to go off script a little bit and uh, share this uh, this diagram again of what is a first thousand day friendly church, because you've touched on a couple of things uh, that for churches wanting to engage with 
fatherhood, there's six different ways that you can be FTD friendly. You spoke about one-on-one -on -one, and that's a beautiful way of equipping and preparing parents and, and also surrounding them in a loving relationship. Uh, so one of the pastors that's part of our network, uh, he and his wife go and visit a family when uh, they announce that, uh, that's a, that a child is about to be born. And uh, the, the pastor's wife sits with uh, the new mom, and then the pastor goes and sits with the new dad. And then they talk about different things. Uh, one of the things the pastor then says, okay, uh, new dad or soon to be dad, do you know how to change a nappy? simple things because it's it's uh, for the men in the room you might know it's hard to ask for help to admit that you don't know how to do something and so they create that opportunity for that one-on-one -on -one conversation that when that dad a month later or six years later has a question he knows who he can turn to to find out how he can be a good father in that situation uh, you spoke about uh, father's day one one uh, thing that a church did last year on father's day and that pray segment, they invited all of the dads up into the church, to the front of the church on Father's Day to pray for them. And it demonstrated saying, dads, we're here for you. We love you. We appreciate you. We want the best for you. You can take steps forward in this, this area. So these are several different things. You also mentioned those different role players, those different NGOs that are in, the, uh, uh, in that area. And that's what we call collaborating and referring, finding out what are the service providers in the area that you can partner with. And I'm going to come back to the parent center to Kosti United in a second to ask them how you can do that. But when we're thinking about engaging and inspiring fathers, we have a whole range of opportunities to do that. It's not just one thing that we do. It's a range of things. And I see, Jonathan, I see your hand up. Would love to hear from you. What would you like to, to share or to ask? I just want you to say on that fantastic um, graphic about speaking up, I think one thing that I really want to encourage all of the men um, and women as well is especially in the first thousand days, invariably we overly romanticize those first two years and we invariably only talk about the positive experiences. And I think it's important that as experienced um, parents that you say, I really struggled with colic. I, I, you know, I, I felt scared of picking up my baby. He was so small. I was worried I was going to break him. You know, I think that a role model is also about showing people how you have struggled with things. A role model is also showing, you know, the, the cloud part and not the, just the silver lining. Um, yeah. Because parenting is hard and it's, and it's only getting harder. And I think if we give new parents honest um, indications, because I think there is an immense amount of pressure especially placed on women. You know, I've had so many women who, who just naturally think that they're going to be able to breastfeed and, and it doesn't come easy with people. And so I think we need to be talking about the difficulty and celebrating the, the triumphs, but also being there for, for the failures because sometimes we learn more by failing than we do from, from success. So yeah, I just wanted to add that. Uh, Jonathan, I appreciate that. And I think uh, one of the things is uh, members of congregations plus church leaders, we can be that warm uh, space for people to offload. And whether that offloading is just I'm frustrated, I'm tired, I'm scared, I'm whatever is going on, that there's a space to for people to share that kind of experience, uh, that that life is real, right? Parenting is real. Um, it's, it's not something that, uh, as you say, you, you don't write your own parenting scripts. It's often given to you what your children are like and the challenges that you're going to face. Uh, and Kosinati, I saw your hand up uh, during that section. Would you like to contribute? Oh, my hand yes, I just wanted to contribute something that on on on, on the fact that one of the things that has been a challenge, particularly from a cultural point of view, because of either just feeling inadequate and feeling helpless around some of the practical training skills of just being a father, or for some cultural reasons, we, we're not taking charge of, and just be proud of being a father. There are different reasons for that. But I feel strongly that as men, we need to take charge and say, I am a father. I don't know, but I will learn. But not only do that, but when it, as a church, begin to say, hey, man, I mean, a church, I tell my guys, if, if you have a child and you've not taken care of, 
that child, we will take care of you. Oh, yeah, in the church. Of course, it's just threatening. But it's just saying, come on, guys. Um, you need to take responsibility. You, you cannot be a man in the church and take leadership roles and do all of those things, having neglected children, yeah. your own children. And it, it cannot be. So there are ways in which the church can say, we need to change the narrative. We need to completely change the narrative that fathers are animals, fathers are dogs, and all the names that men are called. And the only people that can assist in doing that is the church. Yeah. And, and we need to take charge and be proud of being fathers. And I think let's make fatherhood fashionable if there's yeah. such a hashtag or something like that. <laughs> right, we're claiming it now. You're going to see it on social media. In Kusinati, the one thing... Um, to, to add on to what you're saying about cultural practices. And I think that's the church is so well positioned to mediate in situations where there are, uh, I think some of the research the language uses, uncompromising practices or uncompromising views on what men do and don't do. The church can be actively involved in mediating between extended family members uh, in ways that outsiders or a program or People like in Sukunye, we can't mediate in a way that a church leader can sensitively with cultural, uh, honoring the cultural practices and, and working towards the flourishing, as Jonathan has mentioned, when, when fathers are active and positively involved, everybody wins, everybody wins. And um, I am looking at the time and I would love Nkosi Nati or Bishop Salepi to share what is the Fathers Matter Connect group? If it's something that churches want to get going, in, uh, what do they do? What steps do they take? Okay, okay, Richard. I had my hand earlier on. It's just that the machine I'm operating does not show me clearly where to indicate with the hand. Sorry. Pastors are fathers. Pastors are mothers. Depending from whether you are a mom or you are a dad. But we are fathers. When we are together as pastors, sharing our individual stories and visiting one another, we are able to share the good part and we are also able to share the challenging part, just like Jonathan was saying earlier on. And one of the things that we are doing now is to say, Jonathan, my son, I've tried to talk to him on this issue. And I realized that we are not succeeding. And I noted that you have succeeded in your own house in this matter. Would you kindly assist us? Even if it means for a weekend or for a day, my son would come and spend a day with you. That we allow. And when we are in church, we celebrate fathers from different sides. This weekend, I'll be meeting with fathers who do not attend church. I'm happy on the attendance here. I saw some people who came from my area. Some are in towns, there's one uh, who comes from Palady, and that's where we are. We say, come. We want to celebrate you and pray for you. But at the time when we also celebrate, we are also sharing successful stories. Culturally, we have one element that has become a challenge and we, we are working on it, is the issue of money when we talk about parenting. The parents, the traditional leadership or the council and the family will say, Gozinati, we agree that you have a child here, but you are an illegitimate, illegitimate father. You are not wanted near this child. You are not wanted near the mother's child because you never paid, you never gave us any money. And I think, Jonathan, this is an ongoing conversation. When will it end? I don't know. I don't know if this is saying is pushing people to get married, 
or we would rather say it's encouraging people because it's, pro it's promoting marriage. Whether it's encouraging, motivating, or pushing people, I don't know, but it goes either way. The day we are able to, to isolate money from personal and individual relationships, I think we'll have a better society. Not only visiting the child, but building a bond between the father and the child is a problem. And hence we have majority of the children raised by grandparents or other family members, not because they want to, simply because culture does not allow. And what about teenagers who give birth? Because the teenage girl is still a child at home. The teenage boy, the same thing. How do we expect them to play a role, both of them in raising up the child? That's why you see grandparents coming in. That's why you see uncles and aunties coming in to close the gap. So we have more social fathers then we can have biological fathers. In our area, we have noticed that most of the fathers, if they are not dead, they are in prison. If they are not in prison, they are in liquor stores. We also noted that we have mothers who are running away with the children hiding children from their fathers in the name of saying, give me money first, then you can see your child. Is it trading? I, 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 I don't know, but we need to look into the manufacturer because in our culture, it plays a big, big role, but we are trusting that the more we bring different stakeholders together, maybe even on this part of platform one day, if we can have a traditional leader who comes to speak from the cultural perspective to say what inputs, what can be done to try and improve the relationships. Sure. Bishop Salebi, I, I, I love what you're sharing because you, you you're painting the picture, the, the, the reality of what men are facing, what uh, church leaders or congregants that are part of this webinar, what they're experiencing and witnessing in their community, in their, in their church communities and in different parts of our nation. And, and this is why Sukunya is so passionate about seeing the local church not being an observer of what things are, but being an active participant saying, we have a part to play. There are other role players that need to do what only they can do. But as the church, as local churches, there can be this wonderful way of drawing men in to encourage them, to strengthen them, to inform them, to support them and see them playing a more active role. And like with many other things, like with the learning a new skill, you try a little bit, you gain some confidence, you try a little bit more, you gain some confidence and you go forward and go forward and go forward. And um, in course, Inati, I, I promised you that I would ask you, what is the Connect Groups? How can people, I know you put some things in the chat box. There is a resource that's going to be sent out with these links and email addresses and any resources that were shared. But of course, you know, what is a Father Matters Connect Group and why? what can churches do about it? Thank you. Just uh, quickly to wrap up, Richard. I think Fathers Matter Connect Groups, we start with workshops. We run workshops for fathers. And um, if churches want to connect with us, they can um, email me at ngosanati at hotlines.org.za. Uh, um, uh, that will be shared. We run workshops throughout the country. Uh, Bishop Selepe is in Limpopo. We've got people in KZN. We've got people everywhere that can come and run those workshops for you because it's important. And this is a conversation. I mean, we invite men in our workshops, but we find women come to the workshops. So we've got workshops. And then the workshop then is followed by the connect groups, group, group groups that will continue the conversation, uh, support group basically, and men share their experiences. It's a mentoring and accountability group. 
it's six to eight men. We've got manuals that you can run. We've got videos that you can play and just start a discussion, start a discussion. Uh, we are doing module one. We've done module one. We're busy with module two now of the connect groups. We are also doing films as the last one. We're doing films. We've got fifth, six films that will be coming out in September. And we, we will be then just creating discussion groups around these films because they are tackling different issues around father, fatherhood. And so we're looking forward to that. And so the connect groups, you can start at any time. You can download the stuff online and uh, it's easily available and you can, you can use it as your church for a men's group. Fantastic, Kofinati, thank you. I, I saw some requests in the chat box for contact information and links and so on that will be sent to you. Uh, we will send a link uh, via WhatsApp to a document that we are on our data-free website that you can explore things in more detail. Uh, and we hope, as I mentioned in the beginning, to inspire you, to give you some ideas, some things that might work in your context that you can pick up with and run. Uh, but that is all that we have time for from the panel discussion side of things. I'm gonna hand the microphone uh, back to Ruth, who's going to close up for us. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Bishop Salepi, Jonathan, and Kusanati for your contribution. It's been such a rich conversation, and an, I know I could have kept listening, and I, I can see from the comments in the chat box we could all keep going, but we promised to be done at two. We're going to have to find a second time to do continue this conversation. And I see there's lots of questions and comments around some of the real challenges that we are facing in our churches around culture and how do we how do we deal with some of these difficult conversations? So I really encourage everybody who's joined in today to, like Bishop Salepi said, have a conversation with a friend. Um, join like-minded people together and keep talking and see how we can how we can deal with some of these challenging issues. Speak to the local um, organization, stakeholders, get in touch with Heartlines, get in touch with the Parent Center, have a read, and let's keep this conversation going, keep it live in our churches that we do see how we can make some difference in changing some of these barriers and practices that are interfering with men engaging in a positive way in their families in this way. So thank you for joining us today. Um, we trust that this will help you in your churches as we seek to create first thousand day friendly churches and support families. Uh, just a quick note of an upcoming event. Next week, Tuesday night, we have our Sukunya gathering. Um, and we are excited to be having Nali Bali and WordWorks and Dr. Chantal Weber join us. We are going to be talking about every word counts and the importance of early literacy. So um, uh, Pastor Gomba was saying how he reads to his children every night. That's exactly what we want to be encouraging to improve literacy, to help children get a good start. Um, so I encourage you to join us at the Sukunya gathering next week, Tuesday. You're welcome to register online. Um, for a great time of gathering together. And then our next practical workshop coming up next month is on child protection and writing a child protection policy within your church. And so I encourage you to sign up for that and seeing how you can get involved in that way. So I want to say thanks again for joining us. I'm going to close in prayer and um, say goodbye. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you that you are our Father and that we can come to you and we can ask you for wisdom and guidance and discernment with this big topic of how we can engage with fathers. And I pray that you would lead us into our next steps as we practically deal with some of the real, real challenges that we see around us in our families, in our homes, with men and women as we engage with our young, young children. And so I pray that you would, that you would strengthen the hand of each leader that's present here today that you would give them wisdom and discernment and guidance on how to take the next steps forward as they engage with men and women in their community and really try and tackle some of the big issues that are causing our families and our young children to not engage with their fathers. We thank you that we can come to you as a father and I pray that you would go ahead of us, that you would keep us safe and bring us back together again. We thank you for this time. We thank you for our guest speakers and we thank you for all that we have learned today. In Jesus' name, amen.